Corporal Larry Ormond Holly, United States Marine Corps, World War II, folks. That name may ring a bell. Larry Holly was the brother, the older brother of Buddy Holly. There were four kids in the family, Travis, Patricia, the, the, the girl, sister, and then Buddy. And I had the great opportunity to work with the Holly family, to record with them, to uh, perform with them. And just one of the highlights of my life, meeting the Hollies. But I was in Lubbock, Texas twice, 2011-2012, uh, where I first met Larry Holly, And I interviewed him in 2012. It was on the anniversary of Buddy Holly's death, uh, February 3rd, 2012. I interviewed Larry. He was in his late 80s at that time. He lived to be 96, just passed away a couple of years ago, coming up in April 2022 and just a great life, life lived, folks. I'm so excited. This is one of those stories I just couldn't wait to release and share with you. I knew the time would come, and with this coming Saturday being the anniversary of Buddy's death, I thought it'd be appropriate to share uh, Larry's story. Larry was um, a Marine. He served in the United States Marine Corps, 2nd Marine Division. He was a forward observer with the field artillery. He wanted to be a sniper. I thought that was interesting. He talks about that. Ended up in the field artillery. And he also was a military policeman in Japan after the war. So he talks about that. Um, Nagasaki, Hiroshima after the war, after the bombs were dropped. So he was there. But Larry, like I said, lived a great life. And I um, just want to honor him through this video right now. And his military service with the Marine Corps was in the South Pacific. And he was involved with some of the campaigns there. So he'll tell about it here. But I want to thank John and David Penn for making it possible for you to watch Larry's story today. John and David, thank you guys. God bless you both. Thank you so much for supporting my work. I love you both in the Lord. I do. And I just thank you for giving me this opportunity to share Larry Holly's story. And just thank you for your support of our country and our veterans too. God bless you guys. Folks, if you'd like to sponsor a story like John and David, please get a hold of me. I need your help. I do. I need your help. So just if you want to donate to my work, there's information in the comment section of my videos. And just take a moment and look at that, would you please? In the, in the comment section and the video description of this video. So, website is LarryCapetto.com. There's a link that says Sponsor a Vet. You can do so there. There's also a link that says Honor Store if you want to order some of the films I've produced, uh, the military films featuring all these veterans that you love. There's a link there also. So. Voices of History Radio coming up on one year anniversary and hopefully we can keep it going, folks. It's a great outreach. A lot of people have been touched. Over 50 countries have tuned into Voices of History Radio and it's just been a dream come true for me. So I really hope we can keep it going. I, I, I get so much out of that. I really do. There's, there's therapeutic value in these stories. People are writing me. They're using the words like they were healed, they were helped. They, they understand things better about their loved ones that were in war. So a lot of opportunities here. The educational opportunity of these stories is incredible. So help me, folks. I appreciate it. Okay, that's it for now. Thank you for sharing this story. Let's honor Larry Holly, folks. Remember him at the end of his interview. I've included a segment where he talked about Buddy Holly and the plane crash coming up on the anniversary um, on this Saturday, February 3rd, the day the music died. They said so. It's been gone a long time, over 60 years, and uh, but his music is the inspiration behind my music. That's why I learned guitar, started playing guitar, Buddy Holly's music was such an inspiring driving force and still is today. I just, he, he died way too soon at the age of 22. So, Okay, folks, share this video, please. Let's honor Larry Holly and subscribe to this channel, and I will talk to you later. God bless you.
later on when the war broke out, I joined the Marines. I wanted to be a Marine. Why did you want to be a Marine? Uh, I felt like they was the best fighters they was. And, and I did admired Marines. I'd known a few guys that had gone in earlier and I admired them. Uh, but anyway, Tell me, tell me where you went to basic training, San Diego or Paris Island? At San Diego. Do you remember your first day at boot camp? Yeah, I Did remember. You put your feet on those yellow things and all that. You're getting off the bus, or is that just? I mean, do you, you remember your your first few days there? Or it was I remember nearly every minute of it. Uh, yeah, I've heard, heard grown men cry like a baby at night, and somebody throw a shoe at them, get them to hush, you know because they wasn't used to boot camp. It was terrible. Um, I, I didn't enjoy boot camp at all, although I did enjoy being in the Marines later on. What uh, year did you go into the Marines? In 1944. 44? Yeah, there, February 44. Did your, did your family come out when you graduated at the boot camp? Was there a graduation? No, uh, I, I got to leave and came home for a few days. And that, then I had to go back, and then the real hard training started at Camp Pendleton. The rifle training and all. Yeah, that. basically, it's that's where they really start teaching you how to be a Marine. The, a boot camp is teaching you how to obey orders and do what they say, even they though you don't want to, and a lot of things like that. They'd get us up at four o'clock in the morning, and We'd get to bed at nine, and the lights had to be all out at that time. And just stuff like that we weren't used to, you know. But. Do you, do you remember where you were when Pearl Harbor was attacked? Tell me about what you remember about Pearl Harbor. I was in church uh, Sunday morning whenever we heard the news, uh, and it really took us by surprise and upset everybody, and boy, they was going ho to join the service and get after them Japanese. How did you feel? You were younger then and then you went into the Marines, but did you, you, you wanted to serve your country. You enlisted, right? Yeah. Yeah, I wanted to, as soon as I got to the age that I thought mother and daddy had let me, well, I went down and enlisted. How old were you again? I was 18, just barely. And it took about a month or two of fooling around and take it there, getting, you know, they put you through the mill and see if you got flat feet and everything else. And I passed with good colors, I guess. Well, they say once a Marine, always a Marine. Is that true? Yeah, I believe it is because I see guys every now and then that, that's been in the Marines and they know I have been in. They also say Semper Fi. That means Semper Fidelis. That means always faithful. Exactly. And that's the guy wave at another guy and say Semper Fi and and like second Marine Division they say, What up it was you and I say Second Marine Division. He yeah, they say Second Mardiv. You know, that's what they call it. What uh what was your specialty? Did you train to be something I know every Marine is a rifleman, but did you did you train to be a, a special job in the Marine Corps? Uh yeah. Uh I wanted to be in the infantry and be a sniper. If I had one more notch on my elevation on on the day of qualifications at the 500 yard range, I would have had a perfect score because they were just barely out of the bullseye on the bottom at 500 yards. It was open sights and the wind was blowing. But when I got over there in, in, at Saipan, we, we we had an adventure with a Japanese sub on the way there, but I won't mention that right now. Uh, I enjoyed that trip on the sh ocean. It wasn't very good because we really got to needing a bath bad. All, everybody right there, and it's only salt water baths, and you know they'll make you sticky and and there. <laughs> had to just sleep on top of each other nearly. We'd go out on the deck because it was so hot down below. We'd sleep on the deck. 
and then they'd come along and make you leave. And I found an old board about so wide and about so long and some rope, and I tied it up where it would swing, and I could lay on that and sleep up above the other people. It was down below me. But it was impossible to sleep underneath. And the first night that we went out on that boat was Thanksgiving, and uh, they really give us a big meal, you know. In fact, just a few days before that, I heard the lieutenant tell the other one, he said, we got to get these guys out of here. They're getting too mean. We're going to send them overseas. <laughs> so they did. But first night we hit a storm, and the sailors said it was the worst storm they'd ever been in. And everybody got seasick nearly but me. And I had to clean up after nearly everybody. But the waves was coming over that big ship and fish flopping around on, top, on the deck. It was, it was amazing. Whenever we first woke up, there's a bunch of stuff in the mess hall. That there the, them ten trays, uh, they were stacked up. And they fell over and bam. We thought, well, a submarine has hit us. And we looked out, and our our shoes and stuff was floating around in the water. And we was up on the third deck, third or fourth. It was a big ship, the biggest one ship, one stack ship in the navy. It had been an old German wooden ship. But then all the way to Hawaii, a, a sub bothered, a Japanese sub, and the sub chasers would come alongside throwing the depth charges out, and they finally got the sub because uh, we saw the oil slick come up. And But then when we got to Saipan, uh, I'd been to Guam li just a little bit, and they had a little air raid there. And then we went on to Saipan, and the captain told me, there's about 10 of us in the group that went to a certain outfit. He said, I guess you boys are glad to be in the best ma outfit in the Marine Corps, the 10th Marine Regiment Artillery. I said, no, sir, I, I really wanted to be in the infantry. He said, well, that beats me. He said, I thought everybody didn't want it in the infantry. And, but I said, yeah. He said, well, we got a deal we call the FO, Forward Observers, and the, I need four volunteers, and you're a radio man, which I'd learned the radio. He said, you're in it. You just volunteered. Everybody said, you'll be sorry, you'll be sorry. Now, the forward observers, what they do, uh, they go up ahead with the infantry and get out ahead of them and pick out targets and call back to the guns. And, you know, they talk about these these uh, uh, Indian fellows that Old speak. Topics. Yeah. But they, we had two of them in our outfit, but they don't talk to the guns. They talk from one command post to the other. The, the, they didn't, uh, we didn't have to use them up on the forward observers. A forward observer is four of us, and we'd leave out early in the morning and just by ourselves and go around. And there's a volcano on, on one of the islands we was on. Agraham was the name of the island. And we'd climb up that volcano, and they'd shoot over the volcano, a bunch of pig pens and stuff out there. And it was real interesting. You'd call for fire, and you'd, they'd hit out there pretty close, and you'd see you a little bit to the right. And, you know, we had a uh, lieutenant with us, and he knew what to say. He just told me what to say on the radio. And another guy would have turned the crank to cl crank the generator. But we enjoyed that pretty much. It's sort of like camping out. We'd be out there two or three days at a time, just by ourselves. So you were at the end of the war, right? Well, yeah, the war, the, the, big, the big battle at Saipan had been all, it was just getting over with. And there was still a Japanese running around at night and knifing the sentries. And I tell about some of them episodes of when I was on, on guard duty roving around in the cane field. Uh, I tell about all that in this book. And uh, 
uh, we had fired sentries that had been knifed in the night by a job. In fact, it's when we went on to Okinawa later on uh, and came back to Saipan, we found where they'd been living in our tents. And this was way after the, it'd been secured, you know. So there's still jobs. I guess there's still some on, on there now. So were you around the, the, the landing at Okinawa or not? You weren't there? Yeah. Uh, I was, you might say two landings, three landings. Uh, but they made a faint landing off the southern, south eastern shore and it was on Easter morning and we just heard that President Roosevelt had died. Now, I, I hear since then that he, he died on the 9th, but this was April the 1st and we was climbing down this rope ladder getting into the Higgins boats to go in and make a faint landing but even before any of the other troops had ever tried to land. And here come a bunch of kamikaze planes. It was, it was dark up in the sky, but you could see the tracers and everything, and, and you could see, hear them planes everywhere. And well, it was, I was going down this ladder, rope ladder, had my radio and my gun and everything. But... The boat was, it was pretty rough water, and the boat was rocking and beating against the big boat. And one guy got killed because he fell and got between them. But that kamikaze plane was coming right at us, and he passed right over us. And the sailors couldn't seem to hit him with their tom tom, just go boom, 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 boom. You see their tracers behind him, and the Marines would get mad. They say. Well, it looked like them idiots could hit, hit that plane. For I personally could see the Japanese face when it came over, the spotlight was on him. And I could have hit him with a slingshot. I guarantee I could have hit him. Um, I hit a dove with a slingshot one time. It was a really flying hand. It was just a lucky shot. But I tell a lot, a lot of things like that in this book. And then we made this faint landing <clears throat> went around the other side. In fact, we made two faint lands. One on one day, Tokyo Rose came on the radio and said, we repulsed the Marine landing at Okinawa. And we did it again the next morning. And then came back. Whenever they'd start shooting shells out into the water, and they had told us to turn them Higgins boats around and amphibious tractors. So... We did that, and then we was going around to the other side of the island where they was going to make the big landing. And a general came up to us, to our our group, and he said, what are y'all? And we said, Marines. I mean, I didn't, but our commander did. He said, we're Second Marine Division. He said, well, you might as well go back to wherever you come from because we got more Marines here than we need. And we can't even find a Jap. We they hunted for three or four days, never even saw a Jap. They were all. We said we're well, they're down there at the south end. That's where we made the faint landing. Faint. We drew them all down there, and that's where they did end up being the big battle. Went later on. I didn't get to set foot on Okinawa. I was aggravated about that, but since I've seen some of the pictures, I'm glad I wasn't there. Were you around the, when Iwo Jima was attacked, or you weren't, we weren't around that probably then? Yeah, we was the closest island to it was on Saipan. I think it was about 1,100 miles from there to Iwo Jima. And there's one guy in our outfit was out making fake landings there at Saipan, just practicing. He said, you know something? We're going probably going to hit an island that's close to here on the 19th. And this was about the 1st of February. We said, man, what island is it? He said, don't know the name of it, but we're going to hit it on the 19th. And we didn't. Uh, there was three other divisions, the 3rd Division, 4th Division, and 5th Division. 
they hit that on the 19th. But we were supposed to be in reserve if they needed us. And old Howlin Mad Smith, our general, he said, we're going to take that island if it takes every Marine in the Marine Corps. <laughs> yeah, I, I've interviewed a lot of guys that were there. I, I actually was on Iwo Jima several years ago. I made a trip out there. You did? I got some of the black sand and the whole bit. So well, I didn't ever even see a Iwo Jima, but we, we were pretty close. Yeah. And um, it's funny, you can be within 50 miles of an island and you can't see it sometimes. Unless it's pretty mountainous. Tell me about the the pending invasion of Japan. People don't know that we were going to invade Japan before the bomb was dropped. So, tell me about were you preparing for the invasion of Japan? Yeah, um, Saipan got so crowded that with troops that we couldn't fire our 105 howitzers. They were, they were pretty good sized bullets uh, shells. We called them. Uh, we had to go off to another island, which was about 100 miles from Saipan. It was called Agrahan. There were just 91 natives lived on this island, and they didn't. The women didn't have clothes on top, but our our uh, colonel made them put clothes on top. And of course, the guys didn't agree with that too much, but. Anyway, they were, they were a ribald bunch, a ribald bunch. And we, we stayed there about three or four weeks. Every day we'd have to go out and fire. I didn't ever get to see the big guns fire except one time. I was always out there where they should fire too, you know. And we'd call in fire on a pig pen or something that was over there and directly we could hear the big guns at the other side of that volcano, boom, 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 boom. And they'd usually fire one per peck. And then we'd say, well, you're hitting a little bit to the right. The, the lieutenant would tell them how many meters and all that, you know, to, to the right or the left. And the next one would be on the left. The third one generally hit right on the target. And that's sort of the way it went. You could hear them coming over, and it is better. I've never enjoyed fireworks since then <laughs> because that was so much better. And one time I did get to stay back in camp and then go out on, on the patrol, and um, I heard the bit, I saw them working, and them guys had their shirts off throwing them shells in there, and it was, it was interesting to watch. Uh, a good bunch of guys. I, I, they were er, everyone, my buddies. Um, now, in the states, you had some rank ones. I had a fight with one guy because he 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 was a bully, and he had had fights with several of the guys, and they tore the side out, plumb out of the Quonson hut, by, fighting, and he got on pulled on the back of my neck, my hair, and I kicked him. And he said, he cussed and said, Holly, I'm going to get you. I said, okay. And I was scared because he, he outweighed me about 60 or 70 pounds and was six foot two or three on stubs. Um, and he was telling everybody, the sergeant said, move out, move out. there, All you guys, we're going to go eat. And in the mess hall, I could hear him over there telling the guys what he's going to do to me. And I was scared. I didn't eat. He ate a big meal. And we went in this building, and it was a, a racquetball building where you play racquetball. And you couldn't see in there when the doors were closed. And we put a, a screwdriver in the hasp, and nobody could get in. And here he come, and he never laid a hand on me. He was trying, but I got him good. Then whenever, we was in there about 15 minutes, and I went out, and they said, where's Stubbs? I said, Stubbs is going there and drag him out. They went in there and drug him out. 
And I almost got court-martialed over that because they said, I, I run his hearing. And I said, well, he's asking for it. And everybody coming to my rescue, the sergeant and all, they said, that guy was a troublemaker and somebody needed to take him down. And he's a lot bigger than Holly. And, but I was just lucky. I, every blow I hit him was right in the face and on the ears. And Anyway. So you um, were you were preparing to invade Japan, and then tell me about the bombs being dropped. What what? Okay. Indian or whatever. They well, were while we was up there at Agrahan, uh, practicing our artillery, the word came that they dropped the bomb. But before that, we was really we was learning Japanese, and. How, how to approach and talk to them, tell them to surrender and and getting ready to go in. We was going to be the assault troops. We didn't get to go in at Okinawa. So our, our division was going to be the assault on Japan. And we saw that when we went to Japan uh, right after that, as, fr as friends, you know, to go in, and there's bodies floating in the water. And it was an eerie place. Wasn't a soul in that little town. Well, it was Nagasaki. It was a big town, but it just about a third of it was all that was left. And uh, there's a, some mountains, and, and on the other side of the mountains, the, the bomb didn't bother. And, but over here at the Mishibishi factories, and, Kawasaki place, they, it, it busted them all to pieces. Anyway, we went into this town. I've got a picture in this book of, of our troop going, coming in. There wasn't a single Japanese in that town that we could find, except one policeman. And he took us and showed us a barracks we could live in. And we, it was pretty good duty over there. The people, were real friendly. They started trickling down out of the mountains about the third day that we were there. And they found out that we wouldn't harm them. And they had heard all the bad, bad stories about the Marines. And boy, I mean, the, the girls would come in and want to be their housekeeper. They'd do our laundry and everything, you know. They wasn't young girls, they was mostly older women. And everybody had his own little housekeeper. And here comes the the, cat, the colonel, and he, he made them quit. So we didn't like that, but it was good duty over in Japan. What did you carry, an M1 or a Browning automatic or what? I had an M1 when I was in the States, and I loved that gun. It was really accurate. I cleaned it and everything. And then when I went overseas, and they made me carry that big old radio. It was strapped to me here. And then my pack was on the back. Well, I had a carbine. They issued me a carbine. And I didn't like that very much. It wasn't near as accurate as the M1, but it was for close quarters. And I noticed that all the lieutenants and Everybody that had to go out in the lead was generally using carbines. It, it held more rounds. Uh, you could fire, I forget now how many, about 15, I think, 15 or 18. And you could get a long clip, but it. So when you were young, did you feel invincible, like nothing could happen to you? Oh, yeah. I wasn't scared of nothing. Uh, every time I had a fight, I won. I don't know why, but I did. Because when I was a kid, there, there was a string of boxers. It tells about it in this book. I was selling papers, and every day, every evening, I'd come by this gym where the boxers worked out. And they knew me, and I knew them. And he, one of them was a champion of Texas, Babe Hunt. And uh, he, in fact, he fought Max Bear at one time. 
and them guys would get me in the corner and put the gloves on and get another paper ball over the other corner, and we had to fight every day, and nearly a different guy. And I learned quite a bit about fighting in there. But I got where I dreaded to go over there, Slaughter. <laughs> Now you you weren't married when you were in the military, right? You weren't. No, it's not a place for a married man. So how many months were you overseas? Maybe a couple of years, or a year, or almost two years. Uh, and I had been in the states about nine months before I went over. I wonder if I was ever going to get to go over, but I had that radio school to go through and all that. And finally, the guys got to where they'd, at night, they'd fight and tear up the barracks. It'd start with a watermelon busting on somebody's bunk, you know, and then we'd break out the windows and everything else. And then the lieutenant said, we got to get these out of here. They're too mean. They got to go overseas. And we went right, right away. Are you proud to be a veteran of our country? Oh, yeah. I always hated that I didn't get to make an initial landing on, on some island. But I, after reading about the one at Saipan and seeing the films, I don't think I'd have wanted to be there. Where were you when the war ended over there? I was still in uh, Nagasaki oh, oh, when the war ended. I was on the little island of Agrahan. We was practicing artillery. How did you hear the news? They just announced it or what? Yeah, uh, somebody come on the loudspeaker. And there was a whole battalion of guns, about 20 guns, a big M105 howitzers. And we had a colonel. I think the colonel was about the leading man on the island. And there was a Japanese held island just 30 miles from there. It was much bigger than the island of Pagan. And so we had to make stand guard duty at night. And uh, because we were afraid they'd come over there and start try to start something. They had us outnumbered way yonder, uh, but they didn't. I, I get one, one thing. I mentioned I was on guard duty one night and uh, go see who that is. Uh, I, I got tired and sleepy and I seen two guys laying down on the beach on a pallet and I went over and laid down between them and laid my rifle down. They said, Aren't you the sentry? I thought it was two, two lieutenants. I said, oh, man, yeah, I am. But I got tired, and I, said, I didn't know y'all was officers. And they laughed about that. I got up and went on my duty. Wasn't nothing to guard against. The Japs wasn't going to, well, they wasn't about to come over. They were just about to lose the war anyway. I want to ask you a question. I asked when I interview the war veterans that have, you know, that have served in our country, I'll ask them a couple of questions. I want to ask you too, but what is, you know, we hear a lot about freedom. You know, freedom's not free. You hear that said a lot. Um, Larry, what does freedom mean to you? Freedom means the right to live and do as you please as long as you obey the laws of the land. But we don't have as much freedom now as we used to. It's, it's deteriorating real fast. But it's a lot better than in, in the service. You didn't have any freedom. You had to, you, I mean, it's like your mom and daddy, you know. What does the American flag mean and represent to you as a veteran? Oh, it meant... Of course, we always saw the American flag. We didn't see any Jap flags until we got to Japan. There was, well, I brought back a Jap flag. I, I didn't think too much of it. I mean, 
it's it's meant more to me since I got back than it has was then. Of course, I'm satisfied that those guys on Iwo Jima that saw the flag waving, uh, that was a big lift to them because they was having hell. And did you lose any friends in the war? Uh, maybe people you went to school with, or did you lose people over there when you're over there, or people injured or killed? Well, some of the guys I was in boot camp with, I, I heard got killed, uh, but I don't know for sure. You never, you never seen a guy that was with with you in boot camp after you got on, on out past basic training and and all that at Pendleton. And they sent you overseas. Uh, I, I never was with anybody that I trained with or was around. They didn't, I was the only guy that came to that uh, artillery and the captain. No, there's two or three other people, but I didn't know them. Uh, he said, I guess you guys are glad that you got the best outfit in the Marine Corps, the 10th Marine Division, 10th Marine Regiment Artillery. And I said, no, sir. <laughs> I didn't want the artillery, but he couldn't believe that. But I was, there was a bunch of good guys in that outfit. They were just like brothers to me. And I learned to like them. There wasn't a bad guy in the bunch. The bad guys got weeded out in the States before they ever came over. Yeah. Do you think our country is forgetting about World War II? Yeah, I think that uh, these people now don't have any idea about what World War II. Everything was rationed. You know, sugar was rationed, gasoline was rationed, tires. Uh, for the people in the States, they had it rough too. I went through a lot of that before I went over. And boy, everybody loved this country. They loved the flag, of course, that's what this country stood for. Uh, the flag stood for the country. And uh, everybody was ready to get in it and get after the Japanese or the Germans. Uh, the Japs was one that we were really mad at because they pulled that Pearl Harbor deal. So when you came home, did your family, they supported you going, right? I mean, they were okay with you going. Yeah, they was. My mother and daddy met me at the train station whenever I got off. And mother was crying. She was so glad to see me, you know, because they thought maybe I might not ever get back. I'd been over there a good while. I wrote to them pretty regular. And mother wrote to me pretty regular. But it took forever to get your mail. And if you even got it. Um, whenever I got home, it was a, a desolate feeling. Uh, I didn't have a girlfriend. I didn't have a car. And mother and daddy was busy doing their thing, working. And I thought, man, I'm going to go crazy here. I ain't nothing to do. And I missed my buddies, you know. And so I found me a little convertible, prettiest little car in town, seemed like, and I bought it. And then I found the prettiest girl in town and, and got a day with her and went with her nine months. Tell all about that. We had a lot of fun. But I got too ranked for her and she ditched me. <laughs> I, I, I've thought about her a lot. After I got back home uh, and I have a a chapter or two of running around, being wild, and doing a lot of things here in Lubbock. So there was you, Travis, and Buddy, is that it? Yeah. Me and Travis, well, Pat, my sister, was the third one, okay. and then Buddy. But she married a guy, she married J.E. Weir. He was a friend of mine that went in the Marines, too. We never, and he, they were, about nine months behind me going in, J.E. and Travis, my brother, and James Ware, and Bobby Atkins, all went in the Marines because I did. 
and they were about nine months behind me. And I never did see him in Jean, my cousin. Uh, but I did run on to Teddy Jean in Saisibo, not uh, Japan. One day I was a MP and we was going around picking up all the swords and rifles and radios and everything that the Japs had and taking them and putting them in a big warehouse. And I saw him walking down the street one day and I was walking towards him and we really had a rendezvous. And so we got together and had a lot of fun. Uh, Nagasaki was about 50 miles from um, Sasebo. And so we, a uh, roving jeep patrol and everything. I enjoyed Japan and had a lot of fun. So you came home, you went on with your life? I mean, if, if I can ask, I mean, I know Buddy was important to you. I mean, was he always musically inclined or were you musically inclined to or your whole family or what? Buddy was living with mother and daddy. He was about 10 whenever I got out of the Marines. And uh, he just thought that I hung the moon, you know, because I'd come back from the service. And, and I, I thought a lot of him. And I think he, him and uh, Jerry Allison and uh, Joe B uh, got together and they went to that movie, John Wayne, where he would say, that'll be the day, that'll be the day. And they said, let's make a song like that. And they made it just overnight and early and went up there and cut it. And I was with them when they cut it the first time I heard it. Well, he was my brother, first of all. But then I noticed that he was getting mighty good, very good. I just loved it. I never had liked it. Well, they hadn't meant anything like, like rock and roll before Buddy. And I liked everything Buddy did and liked the way he did it. You take some of them songs he did, if anybody else would have done them, they wouldn't have hit. But Buddy had a flair of putting in something and giving it a certain kick that made them, people really like it. And it broke my heart. About 53 years ago today, I didn't think I could stand it. I've got to where I can handle it now. Uh, but when I get to thinking actually about the plane crash, sometimes I lose it, uh, my composure. Buddy wasn't after a bunch of money. He wanted to be understood and people to recognize what he could do. He, that's what he wanted more than anything. But boy, buddy, he, he was a genius. I mean, he had all the confidence in the world of what he could do. He was my protege, I guess you'd say, and I was his uh, mentor. I think of Buddy not out there in the graveyard. I think of him up there with the Lord. <laughs>